Good afternoon and welcome to our Native Gardening virtual series. My name is Sarah Beyer. I'm Outreach Manager for Deep Roots and I'm glad that you could all join us today. So we'll get started in just a few moments here. Through these programs, we want to provide you with information that you can use to create more and more successful Native landscapes. We hope that this series will be a source of connection, community, and inspiration during a challenging time. Today's session is being recorded and will be available on our website within the next few days. Please visit deeprootskc.org slash stayhomekc uh, to see those videos um, anytime and to share them with friends. I'd like to introduce our speaker, Aaron Goss. Erin is with Wallflower Design in St. Louis and wears many hats there. She is a designer, gardener, and how's this for a dream job title, plant procurement officer. So Erin is a graduate of the horticulture program at St. Louis Community College. She's been a speaker for several workshops and classes in that area and has come over to Kansas City a few times recently. So we're so pleased to be able to bring her to you virtually today to kick off our live series. Erin. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, thank you so much for joining us. So you oh, are on. Yay, well welcome to everyone. Thank you for joining us this, this afternoon. Um, I am uh, just fresh out of the field. We are opening our gardens here at Wallflower Design. So um, I'm here to talk a little bit about um, what it is to open up a garden and kind of the process that uh, we uh, like to use and how it relates to native plants. So that's what we're gonna be talking about, uh, winter weeds and other spring needs. And we will take a couple polls, hopefully through uh, the course of this talk. And I will try to um, not stray off topic too much. So we're gonna talk about winter weeds, cutback and mulch, and ephemerals and bulbs. So first up, we're going to just do a little basic uh, talk about winter annual weeds. So winter annual weeds um, differ a little bit than like the weeds that you'd find in high summer, such as, um, or even in early spring, like dandelions, which are perennial. Winter annual weeds, they germinate in the fall and early spring when the soil temperature is cool to cold. They require ample moisture and they produce a lot of seeds. And so five of our common annual winter weeds um, are henbit, purple dead nettle, common chickweed, corn speedwell, and common groundsel. And one of the reasons why I wanted to open up um, this talk, talking about winter weeds, is that when we um, open our gardens, a lot of times, oh, uh-oh. I apparently am not sharing my screen. I'm so sorry. Just a moment, please. Okay, so here we go. So the five common winter annual weeds, henbit, purple dead metal, common chickweed, corn speedwell, and common groundsel. And again, I'm, I'm talking about these weeds because if we don't get a handle on them first thing, if it's something that, um, you know, we don't address immediately, a lot of times our gardens can be overrun and overrun pretty quickly. It's almost like um, an algae bloom, you know, like um, you get a few little here and there and then a week later, they're just everywhere. And so I just want to talk about some ID um, components to uh, how to ID um, some of these um, very common weeds. And the nice thing about these spe specific weeds is they are annual weeds. And so it's easy to get rid of them. So henbit is one that we see a lot. It kind of is a little bit pretty. It's in the uh, mint family. It has the same, uh, a very similar look to purple dead nettle. The thing to remember is that it has, um, it has kind of like a skirting around, a little, little uh, frills around its leaves. That differs, makes it differ from um, purple dead nettle. It also is smaller, it has smaller leaves and uh, it's internode which is the uh, point between a leaf, the leaves is much longer. Um, so that one is one to remember. Also purple dead nettle. Uh, this one you'll see very commonly, um, at, especially in its, in its uh, juvenile form. Again, 
it uh, looks a little bit in its baby stage, a lot like, uh, like a nepeta would look. Um, and then it, when it grows tall, uh, when it grows up, it is much larger than the hindbit, and it does have those nice purple flowers. Now, some people, um, they actually um, want a few of our winter annual weeds because they're an early source, uh, early nectar source for uh, a lot of our, um, a lot of our uh, bees and, and other pollinators. And so it, that is something to consider um, if you, don't have a lot of growth in your garden uh, fresh, you know, in say March or April, um, you can get some of that pollinator benefit from uh, some of the weeds. Another common one is common chickweed. Um, this one is a very small plant, but it can easily become um, a nuisance. It's very difficult to get out of your garden once you get it in your garden and you let it spread. Uh, it is edible. Um, although I would, um, I would encourage you to uh, make sure you know exactly uh, what you are eating before you eat it and also make sure that um, perhaps uh, a critter hasn't, hasn't um, um, you know, defecated on it. You know, sometimes with, uh, with, with eating edible, um, with eating some of our um, our wild edibles, we do have to take into consideration it may need to be cleaned first. Um, so corn speedwell, that's another one that's very common. Um, there are a lot of speedwells or veronicas out there. Some of them are highly ornamental. Um, this one is another really great nectar source for our, our bees and um, our other pollinators. But it is, again, it can be, can be a troublesome within the garden. And then there's common groundsel. Common groundsel is related to our native pacaras, um, and it can be distinguished by uh, the fact that it has a much uh, narrower leaf than, say, like pacara obovada, and it also has um, um, uh, it has more of a cut leaf, uh, which means it has a deeper uh, cut um, between the the little parts that kind of stick out. The common groundsel also. Um, does bloom a uh, nice yellow. Again, it's a great pollinator plant, um, but it is one that you want to be very careful with. And then when talking about weeds, you know, again, those were all annual weeds. They have a life cycle of, of one season and one season only. And the thing that they, that makes them uh, difficult to get rid of is that you can have many generations in one season. They do produce a lot of seed. And so it's very important to um, get ahead of those plants before they, um, before they actually produce seed. And the thing about weeds is that one man's treasure is another man's weed. So a lot of people really like Star of Bethlehem. While it is a, a perennial weed or a perennial plant, it can become kind of a weed in a garden. Um, it's one of those plants that you have to dig every bit out of it, the root hairs included, if you want to um, get that plant out of your garden. So what can you do? What can you do without using chemicals or without um, too much trouble? How can you um, get rid of some of these, these annual weeds? Um, the method that we like to use is something called defrocking. And in, with the method of defrocking, the goal is to cut the plant off at its base. And so that forces the plant to deplete its nutrients reserves in the roots to produce more leaves. And that doesn't allow enough nutrients left over to produce seed. Again, annual weeds, their goal is to, is to grow fast and reproduce even faster. And so when you cut off its source of nutrients, which is uh, the leaves that photosynthesize, and you uh, force them to use the, the nutrients that are stored in their roots, um, they're weaker. And so you may have to cut them off a couple times, but most likely you cut them off once and especially early on and that's, and that's, and that's that. Um, the nice thing about defrocking is you are not uh, disrupting the, the soil at all. Um, there is a seed bank within the soil and every time you pull out a weed or every time you dig in the soil, that disturbs the seed bank and it brings up seeds up to the surface. Now with native seeds or with desirable seeds, that's a good thing. But with weed seeds, that's always not good 
And so if you have a bed that's full of weeds, one of the best methods to control those weeds is going to be defrocking. If you want to learn more information about weed ID, University of Missouri has a wonderful website. It's called the Weed ID Guide. Um, you'll see on your screen there's a link. Um, also, Missouri Botanical Gardens has a winter annual weeds uh, guide on their website. And then there's another great book called The Weeds of North America. This is pretty exhaustive. So it's got more than, you know, winter annual weeds. Um, but if you're into kind of, you know, those, those guidebooks, um, it's, a, it's a great book to really geek out on. And if you're worried about um, how do you tell the difference between a native um, seedling and a weed seedling, uh, there are some fabulous guides out there right now. This one is called um, Seedling ID Guide for Native Prairie Plants. Uh, so these are going to be more like sun-loving prairie plants but it'll give you all the information about how to ID the little babies, what the seeds look like, um, and the juveniles. It's a wonderful resource. I believe it's available through um, the conservation department. So cutting back, when do we cut back and by how much do we even want to cut back? You know, some philo the philosophy out in nature is nature cuts itself back. And so, you know, there's nobody out there cutting back what is naturally growing in a prairie. Perhaps it's burning on its own, um, or perhaps it's just falling over and the new growth um, will grow up through it. A lot of us though do like a, a cleaner looking garden. And so we tend to cut um, back our, our, our perennial forbs and our grasses. So when do we do that? Um, grasses and sedges, we typically cut back in late winter or early spring, generally February, February through March is a safe time to cut back. The later you wait, the better for wildlife. But the, also the later you wait, the more concern there is that you might cut off new growth. Um, grasses grow uh, atypical, on their apical stem. Uh, they, they grow um, just up, they don't grow out. So if you cut off that, that growth tip at the top, that will stunt their growth a little bit. So always cut above the green new growth um, if you can. Um, of leaving about six to 10 inches from the crown of the plant, that is safe. You, uh, a, lot of, a lot of sedges, you can go shorter than that, um, but you never want to disturb the crown of the plant. Uh, that can kill a grass or a sedge very, very quickly. And forbs and ferns. Um, if you are a, a neat freak, um, then you can cut them back in November. I wouldn't recommend that. Um, a lot of our, a lot of our um, pollinators will overwinter in the, um, in, in the stalks of some of our native plants. They also will um, overwinter in the debris surrounding the base of the plant. Um, and so, you know, leaving that up as long as you can is always uh, for the best. Uh, so if you can wait, again, if you can wait until March, um, that is a really good time then to um, cut back the, um, the seed heads and, and stalks that have died back. So how you do it does vary according to species. A uh, general, general rule of thumb though is you never want to disturb the crown or the basal growth of a plant. So that is the, the portion that's growing the closest to the ground. Things like coral bells or hookahs, uh, you really want to leave as much of that uh, surrounding the base of the plant as you can, even if it is a little burnt up and kind of gross looking. Um, Hookahs can be temperamental, even the native ones, and so you want to really protect those throughout the uh, course of the, of the winter, and especially if we have any kind of late frost. And then, of course, watch out for new growth. Uh, this, what you see on the screen, that there is, uh, is Eryngium yuccifolium or uh, Rattlesnake Master. That is the new growth popping up. And when I cut it back, it was almost totally enclosed in the growth of the previous year. And so I had to pull back some of that dead in order to expose the new. And so just watch out for that new growth. Ferns, I'll be very careful about with ferns. Um, you know, the, the fronds are the photosynthesizing parts of the plant. And um, so you do want to uh, leave those up as long as possible. Generally, ferns will, will melt out on their own, but some of our native, uh, one of our native ferns, which is the Christmas fern, 
that one will stay relatively green through about Janu January, and then it'll start browning out. Sometimes even it'll stay um, a semi evergreen even longer um, bef as before the new growth starts. So, um, you know, be aware of the, of the ferns. Um, this is an example of cutting back. So we've got our new growth um, over on the, on the left-hand side is, is what it looks like before the cutback. And on the right-hand side is going to be what it looks like post cutback. So um, I carefully um, took those stalks down um, as far as I could, but I, I left the, the new ones that were, um, that were starting to pop up. And then this is an example of what uh, a garden cleanup or an opening of a, of a pollinator bed might look like. Uh, we have um, our grasses and our sedges are cut back. Um, some non-native bulbs are popping up. And then you can see that we actually leave our leaves as long as we can. We use those as mulch um, for our winter cover and to protect the plants. So now we're gonna talk about mulch. And I think if this would be a great time that if we if we can, um, you know, go ahead and 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 um, put out our poll about about the mulch um, and or leaving the leaves would be great. So we're going to talk about you know mulch options. So here's here's the the first one, leave the leaves. If you would go ahead and and try that one out, I'm going to do that myself just a minute there. Um, so we, at my firm, we really encourage our clients to leave the leaves. Um, it is an, there, it's a natural free mulch, um, a lot, but uh, you know, some of our clients don't like that look. Um, so they prefer the more traditional mulch. Uh, we try to educate them as much as we can or you know, provide them with, with the best information. Um, you know, but sometimes uh, they still choose to, to go with a, a standard a hardwood mulch. Benefits of mulch include uh, weed suppression. It also provides cover for, um, for critters and it interjects uh, and nutrients into the um, organic, organic matter and nutrients into the soil, which uh, especially woodland plants really, really need. Uh, some of our prairie plants actually would prefer not to be mulched. Uh, they would prefer more of the just debris to be left around and for it to take a while for it to break down. You know, leaner soil is better. But our woodland plants, they definitely want a little bit more mulch um, in there. So, you know, best in order, I would say, would be the whole leaves, just leaving the leaves as, at where they lie. A second option would be shredding those leaves, say, in a lawnmower and then spreading them around. Uh, there's a product out there called Leaf Compost, which is a composted leaf material, um, which is becoming more readily available. There's triple ground mulch, which is um, a hardwood mulch mixed with a leaf compost. And then there's your standard hardwood or double ground mulch, uh, also sometimes called, um, I believe it's called oak mulch. Um, some resources for more information about mulch and some of the benefits of leaving the leaves and some information about different types of mulch, what it's made out of. You can go to the Xerxes, Xerxes Society. Uh, there's also, um, these are St. Louis references, but the information is there and you can read about it. St. Louis compost and Brentwood material. And both of those places do sell the leaf compost, the triple ground and the hardwood or double ground if you wanna read more about it. So again, another plug for leaving the leaves, uh, that would be the caterpillar caterpillars of certain butterflies and also moths do overwinter in fall leaves. And so it's important that we remember that not only do we want beautiful gardens, but we want to create uh, habitats for our, our pollinators and other critters. So this is, uh, this is a little section that um, is about hope and um, what we can look forward to when we take our walks on out in the um, in the parks uh, when they open, or maybe we have a, a, a little uh, woodland garden or, or a garden that is some of our ephemerals, our native ephemerals are, are coming up. Um, and then also there are native bulbs. And 
just we'll, we'll talk a little bit about um, some native bulbs. Um, so what's white in spring and melts in summer? And that would be a white blooming ephemeral. So an ephemeral is a plant that, a, I should say a spring ephemeral is a plant that is a lot like a winter annual, although they are perennial typically. They uh, like cooler, moisture, cooler temperatures and, and more moisture. So that's what facilitates uh, their growth. Once the heat of the summer kicks in and the dryness, uh, we, we become more dry, um, then they typically melt out. Sometimes you get a little flush out again in the fall, but most of the time um, they're with us in the spring and then they're gone. Um, some of the most beautiful ones include uh, Bloodroot and Spring Beauty. Those are two of my favorites. Um, but there's also Liverleaf and Mayapple. Uh, Mayapple, if you have the right conditions, actually can be, um, you know, once it's done blooming, it, it will stay around, the, the foliage will stay around for quite a long time. And it's lovely looking out in a woodland uh, with some May apples and also uh, a little, some carex underneath and uh, just a sea of, of little umbrellas. They're so much fun. Uh, white wake robins and uh, golden seal, which um, golden seal is used a lot in, in medicinal uh, therapy. Um, it's a quite a beautiful plant, uh, native that has a white flower and a little red, red berry on it. A few of our other spring blooming ephemerals inc include, um, of course, the Virginia bluebells. If you've not seen a Virginia bluebell, I highly recommend that you run out um, to a, a park and, and start looking for very large kind of bluish, um, blue tinted leaves um, that have uh, blue flowers um, that kind of hang down um, or you can you know, get online and, and, and take a look at what a Virginia bluebell looks like. Um, the, the top photo there is of uh, some Virginia bluebells that are starting to pop up. It's the purple, purplish um, blue um, little leaf that's, that's popping out. And um, they're absolutely beautiful when they are in bloom. Um, other ephemerals, um, we have our um, we do have a native Cordalis, which is um, uh, quite lovely to look at. The bellwort is one of my favorite. It is a striking plant with a yellow um, downturned flower. Um, of course, the wake robins or trilliums, um, those you can see all over the woods. Some of our state parks like Don, Don Robinson, which is closer to St. Louis, but it's um, the, quite a unique um, part, of the, part of the state. Um, the, the, uh, this wake robin, this um, sessile, it's the, the, the photo that's on the bottom that is a kind of a, a reddish brown color. Um, that is uh, one of our native trilliums um, that's quite beautiful. And then we have the shooting star. The shooting star, um, the shooting star is a, actually a prairie plant. It grows more in the sun than it does in the shade. It is a beautiful, beautiful plant. And then our native bulbs. Uh, native bulbs are, um, native bulbs, we have quite a few of them, uh, surprisingly enough. One of my favorite is this Camasia, which is a wild hyacinth. The wild hyacinth um, is not um, widely available, but it is growing in availability. Um, and then the trout lilies. Uh, trout lilies are gorgeous. I believe they're, they're technically corms, but you can um, treat them like a bulb. Um, the Michigan lily, that one is a beautiful lily that is kind of a reddish orange color. Um, we have a native Dutchman's bre breeches, which is a white blooming Dutchman's breeches. It's absolutely gorgeous. Um, and then of course our alliums are all technically native bulbs. Um, they are best planted in fall, but so you want to plan ahead. They can be difficult to find, but more and more are becoming available. And so I highly encourage you to visit your local nurseries or at least talk to them, email them at, at this point in time, um, but reach out and see if you can maybe start finding them um, and planning for, for next, um, next season. So I believe that's it. Um, does anyone have any questions? I'm ready to, to take some questions. 
Um, first question I have here from Catherine Snow. She says, uh, do you have photos of all the ephemerals? If not, what is a resource for seeing pictures of these? Ah, well, there are some ephemerals. Um, no, there are some wonderful books out there. Um, one is called, I believe, um, of course, I didn't bring it with me. Um, Missouri Wildflowers or Wildflowers of Missouri. That one by Denison is the last name. A D as in, as in dog. Um, that one is a popular one that you can see a lot of, of the ephemerals in. There's also online resources like Missouri Botanical Gardens. Um, they should have a little, a little, a little um, uh, tab that you can click for ephemerals. Uh, I believe that uh, Missouri Prairie Foundation also has um, a resource. They have a, 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 an ID on their, um, a plant ID on their website. And then another resource, um, is Missouri, Missouri Wildflowers is a nursery um, in, out of Jefferson City. And you know, even if you don't purchase from them, they are a fantastic resource for looking, for finding information out about native plants. And they definitely have a little, a little um, box that you can check to, um, for uh, ephemerals. Um, also the conservation department will occasionally put out information if you're on their listserv, they'll put out information about uh, what's blooming out in the, in the parks. Excellent. Well, um, we can include some of those ephemerals resources um, with the video as well. So once that's posted, the recording. Um, okay, we have a lot of questions here. Um, let me take a look. Other than aesthetics, uh, Laura asks, what is the downside of leaving winter weeds? Do they compete too much with desirable plants? That and can they be suppressed when other plants emerge later in the spring? That is a great question, and I would say it totally depends on which weed you're dealing with. Some of those weeds, um, they produce so much, um, so many um, uh, seeds that uh, they can just continue. It's like a continuous supply of, of, of seeds. And yes, they may be suppressed during the, the summer when the growing conditions are not desirable, but then in the fall when when the temperatures drop, um, they will, they'll push right back out. Uh, they will suppress native um, plants, especially ones that, are, uh, that don't like competition with other plants. And so I would suggest if you are a fan of just leaving things alone, um, perhaps plant within a bed that you think might have a, a little weed issue, plant some of the natives that are a little more uh, aggressive and let them all compete. And you can, you can like, Play a little game and and see what's um, take take your own polls and see what you think might um, might might win. But I, I would um, I would not suggest necessarily leaving it alone, especially if you have a lot of plant material in there. Um, you are there; it is risky, and um, those weed seeds will spread about too. Thank you. Kevin Seek says, do you have a good source for purchasing native bulbs? So as of now, there are not a lot of, of sources locally. Um, best thing to do is contact some of your local growers um, there in the Kansas City area um, and, and express an interest. And the more um, that they hear that maybe you're interested in uh, native bulbs, um, the greater the possibility they may be interested in trying to, to cultivate them. Um, the only resources that I really know of at the moment would be Missouri Wildflowers. Um, they do carry some. And then if, you know, I hate to head people out of state, but there are a couple nurseries to the north of us. Um, they're still in the Midwest, but um, Prairie Moon Nursery and Prairie Nursery one is in Wisconsin, I believe, and the other one is in Minnesota. Um, both of those carry um, native, some native bulbs and ephemerals. Um, but right now, as of now, there's not a lot of, of resources. And again, it's all about, you know, telling your, your, your retailers that, that you're interested in, um, talking to the local growers, um, you know, possibly even amongst yourselves and see if there's a way that you can acquire some um, native seed 
and try growing your own bulbs. Um, but unfortunately, um, there's not a lot of resources at the moment. Um, can ephemerals be planted now or should we have planted in the fall? You can still plant them now. Um, the closer we get to warmer temperatures, the less likely they are to, to succeed. So um, here at the firm that I work at, we are starting our installation season next week. And we are going to be planting a lot of things like um, Virginia bluebells. And so Virginia bluebells, they are ephemeral. Um, and they are, some places are blooming right now, some are just now coming up. So um, it's totally fine while the temperatures are, are cool and we have ample moisture to plant ephemerals. Um, but some of the ephemerals, for example, the trilliums and the uh, trout lilies, they prefer actually to be planted in the fall. So um, best thing to do is to, uh, is to become as familiar as you can with some of these natives. Um, a lot of uh, growers, and uh, there's a lot of resources online and, it'll, and growers will tell you when it's a good time to plant or not. Um, but most of the common ones that are found, like the, ver like the bluebells, it's perfectly fine to plant them now. Um, okay, I'm looking for just a couple of last questions and then we'll wrap up. Um, Aaron, do you mind if I send you some of the ones that didn't get answered and we'll pass those questions along? Thank you. Um, so is it okay to leave shredded leaves and old straw around native plants during the growing season? If so, how far away from the base of the plant? That is a very good question. And um, unfortunately, the answer kind of depends on, on which, which species your work you have. Um, a general rule of thumb is you want to pull the any kind of mulch, whether it's shredded leaves or straw, you want to pull that away from the crown of the plant a little bit. A lot of root rot occurs because the, um, the mulch is too tight around the crown and it's, or it's too high up on the crown of the plant. So for example, um, if you have purple cone flower and you leave the leaves tight up against those flowers or the crown of the plant, um, it will rot out the center of the plant um, and, and you'll lose it. So, um, you know, kind of pull it out a little bit. Uh, I would say, you know, from the, from the solid base of the plant, about six inches if you can. Um, you know, that, what, what I mean by that is, is where the leaves come out from the base. So, you don't, it doesn't have to be six inches from the plant itself, but just six inches from the actual base of the plant. Um, that's a pretty good rule of thumb. Um, and anything that, uh, but there are other plants, like a lot of our leotrises, those will push up through mulch and you don't, you don't have to pull them back. They'll just push up and it'll be fine. And last one from Claire. I use fall leaves for my garden beds and have done this for several years. In some places, the mulch is several inches thick. If, is this too much mulch and some spots have whole leaves mixed in? Is that a problem? Depends on what you're growing. In a woodland situation, if this is an area where you have a lot of woodland plants, um, you're probably fine. The difficulty with using any kind of, of whole leaf is that a lot of the whole leaves will mat together. And so if it covers a plant, so if you've got your, your leaves like this, they, they, they form this mat and then they form layers and layers and it presses down and it's a little heavier. And if you have, um, if you have wildflowers growing underneath them, sometimes they don't push up through the plant and it also traps moisture, which can rot plants underneath. Um, so, as long as they are not sitting on top of your plants, it's probably fine, especially in a woodland situation because that's mimicking nature, right? Leaves fall down, they're not gonna, no one comes along and shreds them. They don't, they shred naturally, they just break down and they're going to form that mat on their own. It's a perfect weed suppression. But say you're, you have more of your, your prairie plants or you have some of the more dry living plants or grasses like little blue stem that doesn't like a lot of, a lot of, um, uh, uh, it, you know, little blue stem doesn't like a lot of nutrients in the soil. If you've got a mulch that's like, you know, 
five inches, six inches thick, three inches, that could be problematic. So, um, you know, if you can even that multi-layer out, it's probably for the best. Um, and, you know, think about what type of plants you have planted in there. Um, but again, in a woodland setting, I wouldn't worry too much about the thickness or type as long as the mulch is not sitting on the plants. I hope that answered the question. Well, if not, um, Claire, please uh, either email Erin or I'll give you a resource to be able to reach us as well. So Erin, thank you so much for a wonderful presentation and for helping us kick off this live series. I'm gonna put just a little bit of information up here on the screen. So uh, here is my contact information. Um, if you didn't get to ask a question today and would like to get a hold uh, of us, please feel free to either email Erin or myself um, and we will help you to uh, get those questions answered. Um, if you enjoyed this program, please consider supporting this series um, by visiting our website at deeprootskc.org and sharing it with others. Uh, you may also consider making a donation. We're so thankful to be able to provide this service to people during a, a trying and strange time, um, and your support will help us keep it going as long as it is needed. So um, we ask you please to consider that. So uh, as we wrap up this program here, um, you, a browser window will open inviting you to join our Deep Roots uh, mailing list for our newsletter called The Pollinator. If you're not already receiving that, please take the opportunity to get signed up and hear more about our upcoming webinars. And if you um, are looking forward to next week, uh, we are as well. So we'll see you here at 4 p.m. next Tuesday. Thanks again, Erin. Thank you. Have a lovely right, rest you. of your day. You too. Everybody enjoy your afternoon.